Hello and welcome to new edition of eDialogues. This webinar is part of localization SDGs series, jointly organized by CityNet and All India Institute of Local Self Government. My name is Abhishek, and I will be moderating this discussion today. And I welcome the illustrious panel of speakers who are joining us today. I will introduce each one of them to our audience as I invite them for their initial speech and presentation. After each speaker has presented, then we will enter into our Q&A session in which we will try and answer the questions raised by our audience on Zoom and our social media pages. The topic of today's webinar is very important, especially it has become important than ever after uh, this pandemic. The topic of today's webinar is imperative for building inclusive cities. All of us know that why building inclusive cities is very important. In Asia, urbanization is expected to reach 55% by 2030 and 64% by 2050, constituting 53% of the world's urban population and contributing half the world's gross domestic product. Cities generate up to 80% of GDP in many countries of Asia. And if uh, we talk about India specifically, then approximately 55% of GDP is generated from cities. We know that cities are engines of economic growth. They have lifted millions out of poverty, but as cities swell in size and number, they struggle with environmental degradation, traffic congestion, inadequate urban infrastructure, and a lack of basic civil services, civic services, affecting the quality of life of their population, particularly the poor and the most vulnerable population of our cities. If we talk about uh, this, our cities and the, uh, the trajectory of our urban development in India, we have seen that the majority of people still live in informal settlements. Especially we, we, we can see in our cities that uh, slums are growing. There are uh, certain strategic intervention by the government of India to provide basic civic services and also housing to this uh, section of society. But there are many facilities, there are many issues of accessibility that our cities are facing. We talk about children, then we see that uh, we, we, we have observed, we have witnessed that our urban spaces, the recreational spaces, spaces for children are shrinking. Our accessibility to basic infrastructure and civic, civic services, will be, we observe that the people with uh, uh, special abilities, uh, they, they find it difficult to access those services and facilities. So all of these issues we are going to discuss in this webinar and how we can make sure that our cities are inclusive and so every section of society are able to access our services and infrastructure facilities. So first, uh, uh, I will invite because uh, this, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, access to civic services and uh, uh, making cities livable, so this human right angles we have not discussed much we have discussed in uh, in in, uh, in in different uh, forums but in from the point of view of urban development and deciding how will be the the the, the trajectory of urban development will include the human rights issues so that is very important if we are not able to provide good quality of air good uh, quality of air to our, to our citizens then we are denying them the basic human rights so there are several other such issues where when we talk about a different section of society so all these issues uh, uh, we i will uh, request uh, dr ganeshwar uh, manohar mule who is the member of national human rights commission he's an Indian career dip 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 uh, diplomat who superannuated after 35 years of service and was appointed by the President of India as the member of National Human Rights Commission in April 2019. Dr. Mule joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1983 and has since served in several capacities, including the Council General of India, New York, and the High Commissioner of India, Malay Maldives. He has inspired a number of uh, socio-educational projects, including Balodhyan, an orphanage in his native village, 
and the uh, Ganeshwar Mule Education Society, which seeks to introduce innovative concepts like global education. Uh, he is also running a positivity cam campaign so to inculcate this positivity in everyone and also support these uh, the good initiative by individuals and the organizations uh, all across the country. So I request Dr. Dhanashwad Manohan Mule to, to, for his introductory remarks on this subject of in, uh, building imperatives of uh, building inclusive cities. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Mule. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. It's a great pleasure for me personally to be able to speak uh, on a topic that really is very close to my heart. Uh, and that topic is inclusivity. Inclusivity in any uh, dimension, in any context, with reference to anything, has to be the foundation uh, of any concept that we talk today uh, in India. Whether it is women's development, whether it is, you know, uh, the marginal communities, whether it is rural societies, tribal communities, or for that reason, the urban societies, or, you know, when, while we build the cities. Frankly, I'm not very uh, comfortable discuss, dis describing the concept as building cities. I think we should really think of building people building human beings, building compassionate cities. And I think it's very important that we understand and see when we see what is smart cities. And the immediate uh, image that comes to our minds is about cities in cities like New York, London, Paris, Tokyo. In my view, that is not what is a smart city. Smart city should follow what Gandhiji has said in one simple line. I wish to wipe every tear from every eye. How do we take care of every eye and every you know, drop of tear that flows from that eye? That is truly the challenge when we think of building cities, building communities. So one is, of course, uh, to say that those cities should think of people. And people means, as you described, are they children friendly? Are they old people friendly? Are they friendly for those who are physically challenged, our divyans? Are they friendly to women, to poor people? and to everyone who uh, you know, seeks refuge in urban uh, you know, set up urban societies. Today, if I have to identify a single problem that is being faced by India and therefore our cities is a huge inequality. I have seen Mumbai, I have, I'm staying in Delhi for the last couple of years. One of the major differences in our big cities and elsewhere is that you do not see such stark poverty you know, in other places, other countries that you know, the images which are thrown in our mind when we say uh, you know, uh, smart cities. So uh, from human rights point of view, it is important for me. Can you hear me? Okay. From human rights point of view, it is very important for me to see that everybody has a dignified existence, to say the least. And which really means a normal house, normal clothes to wear, food, normal and regular food, which has essential nutritional values. And of course, then we have other, uh, you know, are you, are you able to hear? Is there any issue? Okay. Then uh, certainly, if this foundation is laid, which has to be based 
on really the essential sorry essential human values after that we can go to the next stage where right to employment you know uh, a right to food water right to uh, you know dignity in society at all stages and in all places at all times that we can uh, you know maintain we seem to be still far from these concepts government has fortunately introduced many good programs however as it happens with government schemes the implementation is rather tardy our executives often are criticized for being ineffective incompetent uh, in, uh opaque in their actions and uh, there is always a lack of conversation sometimes the competitive politics too affects the discourse of building uh, you know inclusive cities in places like mumbai and other mega towns we have seen that you have a lot of uh, efforts of government for what they call slum resettlement but often these are you know the building builder builders shark sharks i call them building build, builder shark sharks they often play games in this there is often often an exploitation uh, exploitative element nevertheless there have been successful examples in cities like mumbai where people have been uh, resettled successfully uh, in a in a more uh, i would say Uh, agreeable uh, environment or ecosystem because when you want to resettle people somewhere else you are taking them away from their jobs our our cities are built such that those who stay next to the high rise are often serving there is a uh, interdependent uh, you know relationship between uh, the big uh, high rise buildings and the neighborhood uh you know hutments or slum uh, settlements how to really uh, reduce this distance and difference inequity that is really our uh, challenge uh i i i i am actually involved in as you said building positivity and positivity really has inclusivity as one of the major factors and inclusivity as defined by us as compassion as something that takes into account the lowest of the low the most outcast has to be you know considered as a equal member or equal participant in our efforts towards development so with these remarks i would like to really this is a beautiful subjects we need to dwell upon it more seriously and i am glad that all india institute of local self government has taken this initiative and has organized uh, this wonderful uh, you know seminar where we have representatives uh, from private sector as well as think tanks and uh, ngos working uh, in this area i wish this seminar a success i am sure uh, we can see how it has impacted our own thinking at the end of it thank you so much thank you so much sir for your uh, remarks on the subject of uh, building inclusive cities with positivity and taking care of each section of society especially the most vulnerable section of our society you talked about this uh, slum abrogation plans of bombay in mumbai of mumbai and other places what the government is doing i think uh, uh, the government of india with national institute of urban affairs they have also launched a program called base where they are training uh, municipal officials and elected representatives on how to frame policies so that the needs and requirements of uh, this uh, the every section of societies is taken care of when they are building cities or the planning providing basic services so uh, our next speaker is ms uh, uh, rasta mazid uh, she is india representative bernard mandley foundation uh, rasta is responsible for the foundation work in india 
previously, she helped manage Bloomberg Philanthropies India Smart City Challenge, a competition to select 100 cities for central government funding as part of the country's Smart Cities mission. Rizda has led research in 11 countries for Princeton University's innovations for successful societies to analyze reforms that improve government performance and accountability. She has also served as a co team member on the re-election campaign of a two-term member of parliament, advised the World Bank team on case study research, and managed a global leadership program for a New York City-based nonprofit. I invite Ms. Rizda for her presentation and introductory remarks on the subject. Over to you, Ms. Rizda. Thank you so much, uh, Vishak. Thank you for this opportunity. And of course, to the panelists, uh, fellow panelists, all the organizers uh, for uh, this very important topic. And uh, I will present uh, a very short presentation uh, to set the frame of why um, and how we think of inclusive uh, cities. Uh, and uh, of course, happy to answer any question you and other, uh, and, uh, other participants may have. So when thinking about inclusive cities, I just want to start this conversation by asking all of us to think about cities from the height of 95 centimeter. And what that means will become clear in a few minutes, but uh, or a few seconds actually, but uh, very briefly, I wanted to introduce the foundation. I work for the Bernard Van Leer Foundation. We are a Netherlands based uh, uh, philanthropic organization. We are headquartered in The Hague. Of course, in India, we've been working for a very, very long time over the past uh, past uh, uh, 30 years, so almost three decades. And our uh, main uh, mission is that all children deserve a good start in life, including the most disadvantaged, uh, because a good start in life is the best way to build a happy, healthy, and prosperous society. And uh, this is not just uh, a motto that we use. There is a lot of evidence from neuroscience, from uh, uh, a lot of research that has been done on early childhood that shows that this is actually true. Uh, so very uh, briefly, why we focus on early childhood. Uh, the foundation has been focusing on early childhood since the 1960s. This is all we do. We have a single-minded focus and we look at children, particularly under the age of uh, uh, six years. And, um, and the reason we do that is that the founders of the organization realized uh, decades ago that brain development uh, uh, happens. Uh, of course, a lot of research that was coming out at the time, uh, brain development is uh, rapid during the early years and therefore the investments made during the early years are likely to have lifelong impact. Uh, from this graph, you'll see that brain develops uh, uh, rapidly up to the age of two. Of course, it does not stop developing uh, later on, but this is the single most important window of opportunity that we have as uh, people in the philanthropic space, but also policy makers, people working in the sector to be able to intervene uh, during these years. Why? Because there are a lot of benefits, basically the early childhood phase, the zero to six years, the zero to five years, and even more so the zero to three years is foundational. It is, lays the foundation for everything that comes for a child later in life, good health, earnings, um, educational outcomes, and so on. And not only the child, but to families, communities, and of course, society whole. And again, this is supported by a lot of research. There is uh, a research done by Nobel laureate James Hecken, who uh, showed that every dollar spent on the early years is likely to have a return of seven to $10, and this amount spent on disadvantaged communities, seven to $10. Uh, over a period of time. And so uh, you can see that there is, uh, this is uh, something that is uh, likely to have a great impact, not only for a community or society, but a nation as a whole. Um, and, uh, and so uh, talking about uh, BVLF, talking about why we focus on early childhood leads us to the topic in hand, which is uh, inclusive cities and cities from 95 centimeters. So one of our initiatives is called Urban 95. Uh, the 95 centimeters is the height of a healthy three-year-old by WHO standards. And this initiative, this uh, uh, program basically asks question, this question of people uh, like us, city planners, architects, policy makers, decision makers. If you could think about a city, if you could even experience a city from a height of 95 centimeters, what would you do differently? And when you think of that, that changes an entire lens 
of uh, thinking about our cities. And uh, some of us may think, okay, and, and you pointed this out, Abhishek, as well, is that there are basic services missing and so on. Um, but this is not a different lens. This lens is basically a lens of being inclusive. If we are planning, designing, and managing cities that are working for able-bodied young men uh, and, uh, and uh, women, why cannot we bring this lens in of very young children? Because as you rightly pointed out, they, they need urban spaces more than anything else because their brains are rapidly developing. They need this external stimulation. They need access to greenery. Uh, so they need a lot of things, but that space is sh slowly shrinking. So these are not inclusive, uh, or at least that space is shrinking to be inclusive for very young children and their families. Um, so Urban 95, is a global initiative in India. We are working in Pune, in Udaipur, and Bhubaneswar, but also expanding uh, through a challenge process called the Nurturing Neighborhoods Challenge, in which 25 cities have joined hands with us. This is under, under the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. The Smart Cities Mission uh, is a platform for this. Uh, very quickly, what this means is that we are looking at public spaces, we're looking at mobility, access to early childhood services, to public health centers, to daycare centers, to aganwadis, which is what young children and their families need to access on a daily basis. It is looking at neighborhood scale, where can we uh, locate services that are closer to families that need it most for your very young children. Air quality is, an, is a big issue. It's becoming, it's going to be an even bigger issue. And so how do we how can we advocate for access to public spaces and access to greenery if we know that the quality of air is not good? Um, and of course, access to nature. So these are some of the areas that we focus on. And when I say we, it's a collective we, we in partnership with the cities that are on board for this particular inter, uh, initiative. Um, so this is one lens that we have, is a healthy child development, looking at services, looking at uh, services for their families or caregivers, a family-friendly planning and design and healthy environment. Um, I have talked about it a lot in terms of the principles of this, but what does this mean in practice? So these were some of the interventions that cities uh, in India have tried. And of course, a lot more is going on with the 25 cities that have just joined. Uh, but uh, this is these are two pictures from Pune. Uh, the one on, the, uh, on my on left side is from a maternity hospital, a government hospital, maternity hospital, uh, Sunuane Hospital, where this area was taken up by parking. Uh, there was always very a lot of difficulty in people finding space to sit. Uh, and so one of the pilots that uh, the city did was to clean up the space to make it uh, more spacious and friendly so that young children and their caregivers could actually have uh, a space to sit, but also to learn and the colors and the writing that you can see is stimulating for young children and their uh, brains and the brain development. And the picture on the other, uh, on the right is of uh, a neighborhood park that was revamped uh, with a lot of elements. Uh, you can see the musical uh, piece in the background as well for young children because uh, uh, if they play with it, that also supports their healthy development. And so, uh, so this is. Uh, these are some of the interventions. Uh, this is what uh, Udaipur has done. One intervention uh, where you see the uh, motorbike is outside a pre-primary school, Vidya Bhavan and their, uh, Vidya Bandir and their, um, just making some elements that will allow this to be a safe and secure place for young children. And the image that you see on the right is very interesting because this is about this unused space in a, in a neighborhood. Uh, I know therefore you'll realize is a, is a highly dense um, compact city. So a space that was taken up by garbage, taken up by a lot of strays and of course, parking for car and uh, motorcycles and the city um, in collaboration with uh, some technical partners uh, there cleaned up the space, made it beautiful. And this is now a space uh, or this uh, was during the time of the pilot a space where young children and the families could come. And there were a lot of aganwadis in this area as well. And a lot they brought a lot of children here to be able to uh, take advantage of this small space, but space that is playful. These are just very uh, small examples of what is possible under Urban 95, but just to showcase that a lot is happening. And this is a lens that uh, is uh, not asking cities to do anything different. Uh, but because the cities are already doing a lot of projects and programs um, in infrastructure, large infrastructure program under the national missions, can you bring a lens in that will allow 
um, it to be inclusive towards very young children and their families. So if you're building sidewalks or uh, footpaths, you just need the height a little lower so that young children can access it or families. If you are thinking about traffic lights, can you also uh, make the light stay a little longer so that somebody who's holding a child can actually walk across and doesn't have to run across? Um, so simple tweaks. Uh, some some uh, uh, different way of thinking of how to be inclusive for young children and toddlers. And uh, uh, I'll end there with just what you're seeing on the screen, which is that we believe that cities that work for very young children, infants, toddlers, and caregivers are likely to work for, all, uh, for elderly, for other children, and of course, for, um, for a wide range of citizens. So I'll stop my screen share um, with that, uh, Abhishek, and I will um, take any questions or later on. I'll Thank you so much, Vishwista. I think uh, you have put very correctly that if cities work for children, for infants, they work for all. So, uh, and you, with your presentation, it gives us hope that cities with minimum resources, with but with some uh, creative interventions, they can bring about change. How do they build their cities? How do they design their places, spaces? Uh, to con con congratulations to you and the team and, uh, and the city officials who you are working with for uh, the initiative you are taking. But uh, my uh, the worry is that, that in many Indian cities, uh, we have uh, you know, uh, these very good initiatives, but we need to upscale this at a level where everyone, when I am sitting in Delhi, but if I am also father of a uh, 30 months old kid, but when I am going out with him, uh, we face a problem that we cannot leave him just go, go and explore. So these are the challenges that uh, our city is still facing. City like Delhi, we are sitting in the national capital. So we need to upscale these initiatives at a really large level and we need to uh, speed up our efforts. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, definitely your initiative gives us hope that we can bring about change. Now, uh, uh, with permission, uh, th there is a uh, Ms. Sneha Gupta, uh, President of India Ability Foundation. I request you, ma'am, if you allow me, because Mr. Arbin Singh has requested us to go uh, uh, before you. If you allow, then we can invite Mr. Arbin Singh. You're not audible. Uh, Yeah. yeah. If you allow, uh, then I can invite Mr. Arvind Singh. Otherwise, uh, because that is the flow we had decided earlier, but he is requesting to go early. Hello. Yeah, I can, I can, I can do it now if you want. No, That's if fine. you allow, I can invite Mr. Arvind Singh because he wants. Oh, okay. To yeah, please do. Please do. Please, okay. do. please do. Please do. Thank you. Uh, uh, now uh, I will go to Mr. Arvind Singh, who is a, a social entrepreneur and activist working with informal workers in India. A master degree holder from Delhi School of Economics, Mr. Arvind Singh always had a passion to work for the unorganized sectors of India, and he initiated the same in his home state, Bihar. Mr. Arvind Singh initiated National Association of Street Vendors of India in 1998. Under the sheer leadership of Mr. Arvind Singh, Naswi has been intensively working for the promotion and production of the interest of the street vendors from across the country. It was with Naswi's unrelenting efforts, along with other interventions, that the central law for street vendors was enacted by the government in the year 2014. So I request Mr. Arvind Singh to, uh, uh, for his introductory remarks and the presentation, if he has any. Over to you, Mr. Singh. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek Ji, and thank you, Sneha, Sne Gupta Ji, for accommodating. Actually, I have to rush for a meeting. So we are dependent variable. We don't know where we have to go when, you know, so that's our problem. So uh, coming to the issue, you know, I believe that, uh, and it's a fact that people come to city for jobs. You know, people come for livelihoods. They want work in the city, you know. So as I also grew in a small city, and uh, I realized that uh, people who come to cities and uh, they are not welcome. They, though their labor is welcome, you know. So and uh, uh, and uh, there are, there are a lot of hurdles in their employment. And I've also seen people transforming their lives in cities. You know, qualitative changes in life, quantitative changes. You know, so people incomes have gone. 
you know, people have got into very good work, you know, so I know somehow they have managed to change their life, their families and things, you know. So I felt that, uh, you know, when this particularly urban informal sector, if we are able to create conditions whereby the exploitative conditions are uh, taken out and whatever that, because one of my early realization was that it is not only their low income, but also drain of income, you know, so whatever one earns, you know, so if a person, if a West speaker is earning 200 rupees, 300 rupees a day, you know, from morning to evening, the money is being drained out either to police or to municipal people or to mafias or to people who, uh, who put the things on rentals, you know, so there is drain of mon money from morning to evening, you know, and uh, you won't believe that even till date, most of the urban poor, you know, they don't even keep their money in the banks. They are not even bank you know so they are away from the banks so uh, so uh, so we i began to work on such issues and so and gradually uh, set up many collectives uh, so that they can do away with the exploitative elements you know so uh, and there are layers of exploitative elements if you look into any profession which is done by urban informal sector any you know so once, you know, I, were, I had taken my family to Marina, uh, to Mumbai. My daughter was young many years back, you know, so that World Social Forum was happening. And so I took, the, I took my daughter to Marina Beach and there was this guy uh, uh, entertaining the kids uh, with that uh, toy cars. So, and he was charging quite a big amount. So I asked this guy, you know, that you... The, you, you are charging such a good amount, must be earning enough, you know. So then he pointed me somebody at the top, you know, says that he's watching the number of rights, you know, and he will take money from me. So it's the drain of income uh, for, uh, for the urban informal sector. And coming to street vendors, when we, we got a policy in 2004, but in 2014, uh, we, we, we realized that this policy was not good enough. And because things, when we saw Manrega being implemented through the arms of us, we, we realized that if uh, there is a participation of the, of the people for whom the destiny is being decided, which is mandated by law, then, then only it becomes compulsory. So uh, just a uh, brief about this Street Vendor Act that we got in 2014, this act, and it was during the UPA regime that we got this, and this 2014 act uh, uh, mandates that there has to be a town vending committee, uh, which is elected from among the street vendors. So 40% of the members of the town vending committee are elected from among the street vendors. And it says that no decision about street vending can be taken without recommendation of the town vending committee. That means the and the and the municipal commissioner is the chairperson of the town vending committee. So this and as per the act, uh, section 3.3, .3, a street vendor cannot be removed or evicted without the survey being done and without a decision being taken about the street vendors. So you will be happy to know that this act is the first of its kind in the world and it mandates citizen participation. And so through the town vending committee. And also we had a grievance redressal committee uh, uh, under this act. And uh, this GI under the, the, the a, a district judge heads the grievance redressal committee. And any street vendor who is aggrieved can go to the uh, committee and get the, uh, uh, get the livelihood restored. But the, the fact remains that uh, in India, after this enactment of the act, presently around 3,000 town vending committees have been constituted. And you will be surprised to know that most of these town vending committees are, are, have been elected. You know, there are governments which are trying to downplay the town vending committee because it mandates the participation of street vendors in deciding who, who is a vendor, who should be given a license, where should the street vendor be sitting. So make, and we have been struggling, we have been fighting, we have been empowering town vending committee members. But it's still like, I'll give you one example, like in Jaipur, they did, uh, they hired an agency and the agency did a survey of 6,000 vendors. And they brought in one town vending committee, 6,000 vendor list that the town vending committee should approve. 
and the town went in the street vendors representative asked, how can we approve a list of 6,000 members? You know, so there is always a mindset among the municipal officials that this power, which was earlier with the, with the inspectors, with the journal officers, this power has gone to the town vending committee. And so to one mega city like Mumbai, Mumbai still, they have not been able to constitute the town vending com committee in a proper manner. And then we have another layer called the grievance redressal committee. GRC is a very important step because where does the person go? Particularly a person who is not powerful, who is not connected to the police, who is not connected to the politicians, who doesn't, who does not have backings from uh, powerful people. Where does that person go for redressal? So this GRC, we have been pushing for implementation of GRC. Recently, I was in Madhya Pradesh and there was this guy from Ujjain, a street vendor. He was so happy that he has been also included in the GRC. So two judges and the street vendor representative is there. But then he's saying that the GRC does not have an office. The, DJ, the judges are waiting for a notification where they can see it, where, how will they get honorarium and all this. So making cities inclusive is easier to talk, but very difficult. And I believe that uh, until the livelihood aspect is taken care of, until their mainstream through the jobs, because we all know I live in Delhi. I live in Delhi because of a job. If I don't have a job, I will not be able to survive in a city. So jobs are very important. Livelihoods are very important. And you take any sector, you take West speaking, for example, companies are coming, new companies are coming. They are giving on contract to the new companies. They are displacing the existing West speaker, the person who collects the, so rather than integration, I'll give you one example from Colombia. I happened to visit some years back. So the this city brought in, uh, Bogota brought in a waste management company, but the company had to give all the waste, segregated waste to the waste picker cooperative. It was not that the company takes the waste and sells it or uh, goes and throws it in the dump yard. The company had to give segregated waste, which could be recycled, to, a co to the cooperatives of the West Speaker. So we need very, very ambitious policy, no, not only ambitious policy, but uh, ambitious officials, uh, ambitious system, ambitious politicians who feel very seriously, very seriously that cities belong to everybody and that all the people who have come to cities have a right to change their life. It is not only jobs, it is, it is a right to change lives. I know my father went from a village to a city and he was able to give us education. He was able to give us many things which we could not have got in the village. You know, so cities are very important. And as Abhishek Ji pointed out, the contribution to GDP, they are engines of growth. But these engines of growth should be available to everybody who desires to be part of it. And it should not be limited to the people who are very powerful, people who are very moneyed, people who can only build malls, people who can only set up large companies. It should be available to everybody. Why access to banks are still denied to urban poor? You know, so there are very genuine questions. And not only that, last year after this pandemic, we fought and we fortunately got a scheme for linking with banks for the street vendors. And we have been working very hard to get the, uh, get the vendors into the bank. You won't believe the bankers on the portal of government of India they will so they show that loan has been disbursed but when we go to the vendor they, that money has not been received we put this complaint but the government of india officials they will say that no 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 these are all wrong things which you are trying to point out you know it is disbursed means disbursed so these are the realities which we are facing and uh, we have been struggling for that and uh, we have realized that the most important thing in the struggle of the urban poor uh, in the urban informal sector is to build a strong organization, is to build a strong community, community leaders. And NASVI has been able to build uh, more than 1,000 organizations across the country. Under this Unorganized Workers Congress, we have been building uh, uh, ur uh, urban informal workers organizations. And we believe that through strong organization, through strong leadership, more inclusive cities will come. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Singh, for uh, uh, telling us the, what are the on-ground situation and how urban poor and the street vendors are facing issues uh, because of uh, lack uh, because of lack of a 
a functional mechanism that can address their issues effectively. And I'm sure that uh, uh, the work that your organization is doing will, uh, will bring some changes in the lives of these people. And definitely our collective efforts will improve uh, their uh, situation in our cities. Uh, about the, because you have also talked about the financial inclusion aspect. So I think that without bringing urban poor, without making them in, uh, bringing in, into the mainstream uh, economic activities, we cannot make our cities inclusive. They has to be part of our urban development plan. Thank you so much. And we will get back to you if uh, uh, we have questions for you. And now I would like to invite Ms. Neha Gupta, President of India Ability Foundation. She came to India in 1996 to make a documentary and had stayed back ever since. Two decades later, she founded India Ability, a sister concern of Sucheta Kattani Sakchaniketan, and also got international recognition for the organization. Since then, she has been actively working on improving the lives of the disabled in India, particularly children, and has won various accolades for the same. She continues to strive for making Indian cities inclusive. Over to you, Ms. Gupta, for your uh, presentation and uh, introductory remarks. Thank you, Abhishek. Um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, webinar. Uh, disability inclusion is a passion of mine, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, before I talk about disability inclusion, I want to quickly take you through the current disability landscape. Just one second, just let me share my screen. So, um, the current disability landscape is that disabled people are ridiculed and addressed using derogatory names such as cripple and lame instead of their own names. Um, we get so upset if somebody calls us by the wrong name, but the disabled are continually addressed in this cruel way. They're known as sinners due to bad deeds committed by uh, committed in previous lifetimes, not always allowed to perform funeral rites, not always allowed into most temples because they are classed as broken people. Um, at our school um, and for our disabled kids, we actually had to build our own temple in the school campus um, because they were not being allowed um, into the temples near the school. Um, they're not always allowed to inherit um, and they're excluded from mainstream society at all levels, be it education, employment, accessible environments, transportation, and sometimes from their own families. Now, um, I just want to give you a, a little insight into uh, the education status in India. Um, this is the most crucial inclusion space for me because if anybody misses out on their education, that really is detrimental to their future lives, future livelihoods, um, and so, I just want to give you a snapshot of inclusive education in India for kids with disabilities. Primary school, 60.4% taking part. Upper primary, 28.33%. Secondary dwindles down to 6.59%. Upper secondary dwindles down even further to just 5%. This is how we're already throttling the inclusion of disabled kids into our mainstream society. Imagine your kid being denied an education. Then decide whether our disabled kids should be denied an education. Okay, so what is, what is our long-term goal in all of this? Our long-term goal and long-term outcome is integration of people with a physical disability into the social fabric of mainstream society at an everyday ordinary level by being represented in all spheres of life, 
including their socioeconomic participation, to work and learn in sustainable livelihoods. These are basic norms enjoyed by most non-disabled citizens, like you and me, living a routinely day-to-day -day lifestyle. That's what's really important. It's the everyday ordinary and the routinely day-to-day -day lifestyle. So how do we achieve our um, inclusion vision or mission? Well, we do it through education and sport, and in particular through our sport for development and social change program called IMAGE. What is IMAGE? IMAGE stands for Indian Mixed Ability Group Events. SKSN has always had a strong sports program running parallel to the academic one because sport helps us build our disabled students' self-confidence and self-esteem. That's why we thought sport could also help fulfill our inclusion goals. So in 2012, I decided to take the, our disabled youth to the doorstep of the communities where they were being shunned and ridiculed. Using a specially designed curriculum, I started training our older disabled kids, 15 to 18 year olds, to deliver important knowledge on health, education, gender and disability to eight to 12 year old village children through sport and play. Now, this is not something that you would see every day. You would not see disabled people or disabled youth doing something for the non-disabled. It's usually the other way around. mentors because of the kind of knowledge they were gaining from our kids. This helped our disabled kids to spearhead their own social inclusion. And also as, um, as an added advantage, um, since our disabled kids are running this image program, they're also gaining Sorry, I just um, I just need to share my screen again. Please. Sorry about that. Internet connection in Jodhpur is not always very good. Yeah, it is visible now. Yeah. It is okay. Okay, um, and um, and also an extra special opportunity for this social uh, inclusion, particularly with adults, comes when. Um, our disabled kids, um, before actually doing the uh, image session, um, the day before, they go around the villages and they talk to adults and they get their feedback and they interact with them. So this, this gives us an opportunity to build a stronger rapport between everybody, you know, be it kids, be it adults, be it our disabled kids or the non-disabled. So why have we chosen image. Um, through image, we are able to force people from the disabled and non-disabled communities to move from their comfort zone to a contact one. Image allows our disabled children to prove their capability because the automatic assumption is that disabled, the disabled need to be cared for. Being disabled, what can they possibly contribute? What can they possibly do? Our disabled students learn that if they are to be accepted into mainstream society, they need to prove themselves as productive members of their communities, which is really very important, very important. It's, 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 not, it's, it's a realization that comes in gradually and gently. And mainstream communities realize that they cannot continue to denigrate disabled people when our disabled students are clearly demonstrating they are positive role models, not only for the village children, but for the village adults as well. Okay, so why do we use sport and play? Sport and play speaks one common language that everybody can understand, and it doesn't actually need verbal language to do that. 
Informal learning, sport and play pulls people together to teach important knowledge and information. Sport and play teaches skills and values that are not always taught in the classroom. Self-confidence, self-esteem, teamwork, communication, leadership, and the biggest of all, respect. So the impact of village, uh, Im image in the village, or actually I should really say, what impact do our disabled kids make to the people of these villages? It's in um, five sectors, health, education, gender equality, disability awareness, and environment. So um, I just have a few stats for you. Um, the first one is on health. When we first got into these villages, we did a baseline study to, to give us an idea of um, uh, what people were doing regarding their health. And we found that the number of people, uh, children and parents, that were using mud to wash their hands after open defecation was something like 77, 77%. However, by the time we got to midline, this had dropped to 23%. Um, and in children, it was 57%, dropped to 32%. The number of children and parents who started washing their hands with a thing, a contraption called the tippy tap, which was a very basic uh, hand washing station made out of bamboos and, uh, uh, and a jerry can full of water and a soap uh, hanging from a string. Um, they hadn't used it, but the take up on this was enormous. For adults, it was 81%. For kids, it was 80%. So they clearly liked the idea of washing their hands with soap. Education and gender. Again, children. Only 72% of the children were going to school, continuing their education. By midline, this had increased to 91%. And I have to say that a lot of it had also to do with the fact that because they were seeing our disabled kids being in school, going to school, studying, learning, and being able to come back to this, the, these villages and to impart this kind of information made them realize that they could actually emulate our disabled kids. Number of children who believe um, it was a waste to uh, invest in a girl's education used to be 26% at baseline, which dropped down to 12%. Kids, 31%, which dropped down to 25, uh, 26%. Um, disability awareness, number of um, non-disabled children and parents accepting disabled people as normal human beings was 62% in adults and 55% in uh, children at baseline. And this increased to 85% and 80% by midline. Um, that's quite an enormous jump. Um, Non-disabled um, children and parents accepting disabled people uh, can have any number of non-disabled friends. Um, again, this was, this was, this was pretty uh, reassuring because even at baseline, it was 80% uh, in adults and 77% in children, um, but this rose to 94% and 92% um, respectively by midline. And then just a little bit of environmental awareness um, that our disabled kids were able to bring to these villages. Number of children and parents dumping garbage immediately outside their home, um, because this is related to health matters as well. Um, used to be 82% in adults and 87% in kids, which dropped down to 53% and 57% respectively. Um, and the number of kids and parents who took their garbage to a village pit in the end um, used to be only 2% and 8% in um, children and adults. That went up to 36% and 44%. So, you know, it clearly, it clearly kind of shows the uh, impact that um, this program was making um, on the people of these villages and the children of these villages. It was also um, the, our disabled kids, even though they, there's a huge stigma attached to disability, they were becoming very accepting of this disabled community because they saw this disabled community doing some, something good for the villages. 
Okay, so finally, I want to bring you to uh, the SGDs because that's what you have been um, uh, um, involving and including in your inclusive cities. And I have to say that, um, you know, when the MDGs were released, there was no mention whatsoever of disability um, in them. Uh, however, in the 2015 UN SDGs, um, disability was included explicitly in those five um, uh, SDGs you can see. And um, number of people, num uh, persons with disabilities and disability itself was explicitly mentioned 11 times in the SDGs. People in vulnerable situations was also mentioned six times. So um, quite an achievement um, with all the, um, the um, um, canvassing that the dis disability community does to, to be able to get this far. Um, now, these are all of the SDGs that Indiability and SKSN is linked with. It was great to see how much disability inclusion work we had already been doing for 24 years since 1991, well before the SDGs were announced in 2015. I would now like to uh, just say thank you by showing you a very short film on um, our kids and, um, and a new path that we're trying to tread, which is inclusion through agriculture. So take a look. SKSM provides boarding school education to children with physical, we educated hundreds of disabled school education to children with physical and mild intellectual disabilities. We've educated hundreds of disabled children since 1991. We nurture our disabled children from childhood to livelihood, be it through academic education, physical education, sport, cultural education, and now even agriculture. When India went into lockdown in 2020, it was devastating for us to send our kids home right in the middle of their exams. But some kids had no homes to go to, and others, sadly, were kicked out of their homes. As the lockdown continued indefinitely, we had to find new ways to keep our kids occupied. Fruitful group discussions led to a decision to start a farm on the school campus. First job, find water. Great omen, the water god gave us sweet, palatable water at a depth of 850 feet. After that, there was no stopping our kids. Take a look.
So thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Ms. Negupta, and uh, uh, for your presentation and the works you're doing with these uh, kids. I'm sure that uh, you these kids will become self-dependent and then they will also uh, help in uh, our collective efforts in making our cities and our societies inclusive overall. Not just cities, because we are working in rural areas also. So our villages will also become inclusive and uh, uh, it will definitely uh, make our societies and uh, livable for everyone. Thank you so much. Now uh, we have questions from the audience. Uh, I will go one by one. Uh, the first question that is for Dr. Mule. Uh, uh, Radhika is asking one question uh, that about this, as we know that the spatial dimensions are dominated by human geographers and not human rights experts. Do you think that this could be a possible hindrance in making inclusive societies and urban infrastructure? So, uh, sir, I would like to add uh, one more uh, question of mine that uh, when we talk about uh, urban development, we talk about technical jargons like smart cities, but we have not included this inclusivity, whether we talk uh, inclusivity in, uh, when we uh, look at the human rights issues, we do not think about human rights issues uh, when we are making cities. Is it the case with the, uh, the, the issue with the urban development right now in India? And maybe some uh, the global. Dr. Mulia. Yeah. Hmm. So, he, so he's not reachable, I think. So uh, I will move to Ms. Ne Gupta. There is uh, two questions uh, for you also. So what are the issues that you face while handling children on varied spectrum of disability? And uh, Shivi has asked uh, another question, two questions. How do you train differently able children to be competitive in the long run for managing a sustainable livelihood? So, yeah, um, actually, it's we don't actually face any issues um, because we don't have problems working with um, disability. Um, we've been doing it since 1991. Um, the issues are actually faced by the other side. Um, it's the disabled who feel that um, they, they don't actually measure up to the non-disabled community uh, because they've actually not it's, it's not that the disabled can't do things. It's the fact that the non-disabled are always telling them that you can't do what they want to do or what they should be doing, you know? So they're never allowed to prove that they are capable of doing things. Um, so for us, it's um, as soon as we get a kid in, um, they have to become independent within the first two to three months of coming to us. I mean, become independent means literally become independent no matter how severely disabled they are because one we don't have the financial resources to be able to give them uh, a one-to-one -one, um, uh, care in our institution um, but also the whole point of getting them to our organization is to actually make them independent you know um, if they don't become independent with us then there is no way that they will survive uh, forget about their villages, but definitely not in the cities, because after after being educated, after going to college, after getting their degrees, becoming teachers, you know, eventually they most of them will find jobs in the cities. And that's why for us, disability inclusion is so important. So for us, it's not a problem. Um, other disabled kids, when new kids come in, other disabled kids help them. You saw um, kids in the film, you know, um, if they didn't have any hands or arms, you know, they were using their feet to do their writing, reading, I mean, literally everything, you know, um, they were playing cricket. There wasn't, actually, there isn't anything that our kids cannot do. Um, in fact, I would challenge you to show me if you could get up on the Malcolm pole and do what they were doing, you know. Um, they, they, they do so much. Um, uh, many times I'm the one who feels disabled, not them. So, you know, it, th this, this challenge and this issue is more related to non-disabled people, not the disabled people. Um, the second question was, how do we train them? 
Well, you know what? They, they watch other kids. They, they learn from them. We had a kid uh, who came in last year, a year before last, who was 10 years old. He was uh, a non-disabled kid going to a normal school and then he got electrocuted and he lost both his arms. Um, and when he went back to school um, without both his arms, suddenly he was being treated in a very different way, in a very derogatory way, in a very, you know, they, they were, there was a huge stigma attached to the way they were treating him. You know, and this kid couldn't understand how his friends who were his friends when he was non-disabled suddenly had changed so drastically when he became disabled. So um, he came to our school and we have um, other kids who are like him. And he, he couldn't believe that these kids were doing everything that they were doing. Uh, until he came to our school, his mother was feeding him. His mother was clothing him. His mother was bathing him. You know, well, we can't have that. And we can't have the mother come and live in, in our school to look after her, her son. So he, he looked, he watched. Um, and he learned, he, he found it difficult to write with his feet, but you know, um, other kids, we have a very helping uh, community. Kids who are, who are um, kind of, um, uh, uh, they've been living at the school for a number of years, who know, who know what the, the game is, actually act as mentors for the others. So they learn, they learn. Uh, thank you so much. And now, uh, things like, I think uh, there was a question from Radhika and Shivi uh, that Ms. Rashida has already uh, answered. But there is a, one more question that is open to all the panelists. One is that uh, uh, that I will direct to Ms. Rashida because she has been working with uh, urban local bodies in some cities. So the collaboration is an important ingredient for the success of anything. What initiatives do you think should be taken by the private sector towards making cities more inclusive? Thanks, Abhishek, for the question. Uh, so one of the, uh, I, I will still answer very quickly the question that I answered in the chat box, which was, how do we really bring this kind of information on early childhood? to uh, communities, uh, low, low income communities, disadvantaged communities uh, uh, that are not uh, really aware that uh, the early years are important. And uh, just to say that that is very much part of Urban 95, but also um, uh, various parenting initiatives that we do, but also the government does. And it's uh, early childhood is uh, an area that's growing and hopefully more information along these lines would be, uh, will grow. But of course, this is an invitation to everybody who is part of this conversation and uh, uh, understands the sector to really spread uh, uh, awareness around this issue and to join us uh, as part of the early um, childhood community. And I love Sne's uh, presentation. And of course, uh, one, uh, one uh, uh, kind of collaborative opportunity to your next question is to think about uh, very young children also, uh, who, uh, and if we intervene in the early years, then how uh, that can also have a transformative impact in many, many ways uh, for uh, very young children as well who may be uh, disabled. Uh, now uh, to the question on private sector. Um, so this is an interesting question. We uh, are, uh, we governments mostly because the idea is that government is already operating at scale. Uh, to your comment also earlier, Abhishek, on how these things need to be scalable. And that's exactly the reason we work with government uh, mm -hmm. because they alone have the ability to scale things uh, faster than uh, small organizations like ours or even bigger philanthropies may be able to do. Uh, and that's, uh, that's part of the thinking. That's very much part of how uh, these ideas can spread uh, and cities uh, and governments can take it on. Uh, but in terms of the private sector, the uh, early childhood is very much an integrated approach. It is not one sector or one thing, all different kinds of stakeholders have to come together uh, to make it, uh, um, make it uh, work for young children, uh, for uh, the youngest uh, residents or citizens of a city. And therefore private sector as well is a very component. And here, um, the way we've seen private sector come in is with cities and the city governments at the center, uh, the private sector is uh, contributing through funding. Uh, so uh, they do have CSR funding, they have flexible funding. And uh, in terms of doing a lot of the pictures that you saw, 
lot of the funding was also provided by uh, companies and groups that the cities uh, work with. So there is the funding um, aspect of it. There are also uh, the aspect of really uh, thinking this through, if you're thinking of developers, if you're thinking of uh, uh, really a large group of people that are working in cities uh, from a design perspective, from an infrastructure perspective, if they can take on some of these ideas or related ideas uh, um, and, and contribute. Uh, then, uh, then that is that is one way of uh, also thinking about it. So the scope is huge. I think I don't want to list all the ways that the private sector uh, can contribute, but to say that they are a critical piece of any initiative. The ones that I've talked about, or other other panelists have talked about, and uh, they should come forward. Or uh, groups like us that are working on new things should, of course, include them uh, in order to collaborate. Can I just say, Abhishek? Yeah. Yeah, um, please. That um, you know, if if we if we want to stop pointing the finger at the disabled community and say you know they should be doing more, they should uh, they should know how to live alongside um, uh, non-disabled people. One of the things that needs to really happen in urban cities is that um, government buildings definitely should become more accessible. They should be accessible friendly. You know. There was an audit carried out, um, this is two years ago, of two and a half thousand buildings, government buildings, up and down India, length and breadth, okay? And none of them, zero, nil, were actually uh, classified as disabled friendly, actually classified as accessible, you know? So we, we, how, how are disabled people to go about their lives independently if you don't provide them the infrastructure to be able to do that. Completely agree with you what you have, what you're saying, it's true. And then we, we when we go about our daily lives, we have seen these these people, uh, the, for those of the, the physical inability, they face challenges in going about day to day to day lives. So, uh, uh, so I think in silos uh, under the smart cities vision, there are some cities like uh, Vishakhapatnam where they have built a dis uh, disabled friendly park. So, but these are very, uh, very, very few initiatives that are taken by some uh, local governments here and there. But we need to definitely, if we want to, if there are certain case studies. It should be provided to every city, every local government, so that they can take such initiatives at their own level. And that that is like uh, Ms. Rashda also said that the governments can really help in scaling up uh, the initiative that individuals and the organizations are doing at their own level. I'm sure that uh, the, we will be able to create awareness, raise awareness among the people and city leadership uh, the role of city leadership is very important in localizing the sdgs that also talked about like you mentioned about uh, making cities inclusive making them disabled friendly so i'm quite sure that uh, this will happen and it will oh, in in the times to come we will be able to deliver what is required to make our citizens yeah you want to say something i just want to say one thing this is a thought that all non-disabled people should also bear in mind okay today we're talking about the disabled community don't forget that us the non-disabled community are going to get old and when we get old we actually become disabled in some way or another okay so so in any accessibility that is that is available for the for the disabled people who are disabled actually disabled will also to uh, enrich the lives of the older people later down the line. So you know it, it it's going to serve uh, a number of sectors of population, not just the disabled. Yes, you're right. Definitely, uh, when we're talking about disabled friendly children friendly and also the elderly friendly cities where the elderly population of our city. right now we are a young nation but that there is a threshold that after 20 years 30 years down the line our huge population will be old so we have to make sure like japan is facing right now there are a, a huge number of people living in japanese cities uh, they need accessible infrastructure and facilities 
in their cities. I think Jap some Japanese cities are doing excellent work in that direction. And I am sure that with collective efforts of uh, private players, uh, civil society, and the government, we can uh, make our cities inclusive. And uh, of, as a representative of All India Institute of Local Self Government and Urban Update Magazine, we are open to suggestions and we are open to collaborations. If any organization, those are uh, the or in the audience or in the panel, they want to collaborate for anything that is beneficial for the society at large, we are open to the ideas and we will put our efforts and our resources for uh, this these initiatives. Thank you so much for joining uh, this conference. And uh, uh, after uh, this conference is over, we will be publishing the detailed report of uh, the outcomes of this uh, webinar and in our Urban Update magazine. And definitely we will share it with you, the outcomes and uh, the report. Uh, uh, and thank you once again. And uh, in the next month, we will be back with another subject on localizing, localization of SDGs on different things. Uh, we'll be back. Till then, stay tuned to Urban Update. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you.